live on Facebook and others of us will be on Zoom because I like to see everyone. So good evening to everyone and how are you doing? Welcome to our Bible study tonight for Restoration Love Center Jacks. And we stopped before with our Fruits of the Spirit and that's what we will continue with. I will ask that um, Minister Hayes unmute her microphone and say a word of prayer, and then I will read a brief scripture. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we come to you, God. We thank you, O oh God, for how you've been a good to us. We thank you, O oh God, for another time to come to a worship service with you and to impart the word of God. Father, now in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that you will move in this circle on the way around. Father, I'm asking you to dismantle and eradicate the coronavirus. And God, those that are lying in the hospital and at home struggling, help those, God, to breathe. I ask that you breathe in them again. God, in the name of Jesus, we need wisdom <clears throat> in the White House, Lord. We need you to give the direction for this country. Lord, we don't know what time we're in, but we know it's a season of the full rapture. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Amen. Tonight's scripture will be Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like a chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sitters in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers and the doers of his word. Again, I want to thank you for joining us here at Love Center, Restoration Love Center Jacksonville for our Bible study. Um, we were just watching our news brief here in Duval, and from our governor, we're going to start opening our state slowly and it kind of has me uh, thrown because I'm not certain that that's a good idea so I want all of you out there that are not here in Florida with us to please pray for us as we do this that we will do this um, with wisdom that we will still abide by what we are supposed to do with our mask and washing of the hands and gloves because this thing is real and it's not a joke. And we will continue to pray for you also. I want to do um, tell you that we did hear from Elder Mark Daly from Birmingham, England. And he said he is recuperating nicely. So we thank God for that. And I also want to thank God because his siblings are now home from the hospital and they are recuperating very slowly, he said, but they are recuperating. So we thank God because the fervent prayers of the righteous do avail much. Also, we want to thank God for touching uh, Deborah McGrew's body here in Kingsland, Georgia. And she worked here in Jacksonville with us and she has been fighting that COVID virus and she had requested prayer and I thank God how she is doing much better as well. We just thank God for those things. Continue to pray for those who are still under the weather from it, those families who are still affected by it, whether it through illness or through somebody passing away. We want to remember all those because this is far from over. Amen. So tonight we want to continue with our study of the fruit of the spirit. And I'm going to try and do the screen share here. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to see it. Can everyone see that? Okay, wonderful. So the fruit of the spirit is what we were studying a couple weeks ago, and we will start again there. 
and we will review just for a moment. The fruit of the Spirit is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And while I'm here, if you have a question, you can unmute it. And, and ask it and we'll try and, and get to your question. And those that are live, um, there's somebody manning the chat box uh, you, and you can ask your question there. In review, the first three fruits of the Spirit we went over were love, joy, and peace. We found that love had four types, but we as the children of God strive to have the agape, which is the unconditional love, which is the God love. We know that God loves us unconditionally, so much so that he laid down his life for us. Also, there was joy. Joy, we learn, usually was not relating to oneself or not due to materialistic things, but it was soul satisfying. We also went as far as to say the joy of the Lord was our strength. And we used the example how everything could be falling apart around us as it was or is with the COVID virus, but we still had the joy of the Lord in our soul and we could still walk around and smile because we knew that God had it all under control. Peace, the internal peace of mind, external world peace, Philippians 4 and 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding through our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So those were the first three fruits of the spirit. And we determined that the fruit of the spirit was just not um, nouns, but it was characteristics that we should have after giving ourselves to Christ, after uh, being baptized, our sins be taken away, getting filled full of the Holy Ghost. We know that that is Jesus himself residing in us. These are the characteristics that we are supposed to be showing as Christians. We also determine that we as Christians, even the new ones coming in, we're like babes. We have to learn. So this is why it's important to come to Bible study. These things will not come overnight. They have to be taught. New babes in Christ have to watch. That's why you have to watch how you talk. Watch how you act because they're watching you. That saying is so true, I can show you better than I can tell you. Because people would do as you do and not so much do as you say. So now we come to this week with long-suffering. The dictionary has stated that long-suffering is having or showing patience in spite of troubles, especially those caused by other people. So, Matthew chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, speaks of turning the other cheek, as you can see on your PowerPoint. And it reads, Ye have heard it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. That sounds kind of rough, and it sounds like we can't do it, or it can't be done, but it can be done. Should somebody do something wrong to you, it's not up to us to take action. It's up to us to turn the other cheek, not stand there so they can slap you. That's what we all think. When it says turn the other cheek, you're really going to stand there and let somebody slap the other side of your face. That means don't hold it. Don't hold grudges. Forgive. Give someone a chance to come back to you and apologize. Or if you have aught with your brother, go to them. Try and go to them and talk it out. Turn the other cheek. Romans 12 and 19 states, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That has been a challenge for a lot of us, especially when somebody keeps uh, hurting you, 
keeps bothering you. It's different when they don't know it. But when they do, that's the thing that hurts. And that's the thing that frustrates us as carnal individuals in our carnal mind because we know they're purposely trying to do something to us. But when you have the Holy Ghost, it gives you the power to overcome. And it gives you the power to stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. I remember my mom used to tell me that growing up because I would be so angry. And I'm not, I, well, I'll take that back before I even let it come out of my mouth. I used to be one not to say anything. I used to be one where i rather run home and cry than to stay there in confrontation because that's just, that's just who I am. That's just my being. But life has taught me and experience has taught me you need to tell somebody right when they're rubbing you the wrong way so that way you can rectify it. But then it got to the place where somebody was doing something to me on purpose and it infuriated me, not because I was afraid for my life, but it infuriated me because I thought that they were so disrespectful and so nonchalant about my feelings that they were just going to do what they wanted to do anyway. And my mother would always tell me, Tam, give it to God. Tam, give it to God. And I finally asked God one day, well, when are you going to do something? But how many of us know that God's time is not our time and he sends us through temptations for a reason and he sends us through tests and trials for a reason? I was in, uh, I want to say it was a um, Sunday school class and there was an elder teaching us at my home church in Youngstown, Ohio. And he was telling us how he was down at the YMCA playing basketball. And I'll never forget this because then after he taught us that, something happened to me. And I'll tell you what it was. He said he was playing basketball. And at the Y, anybody can play. If you have a membership, anybody can play. Well, this gentleman took it too far, got mad at him, and spit in his face. So how many know... If you spit in somebody's face, it would take all the Holy Ghost in heaven to keep you off that person. Why? Because number one is nasty. Number two is, is germs and, and sepsis. And I could go on and on being a medical personnel. But he said that in the split second, the Lord told him, vengeance is mine. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. He said he walked off the court. He wiped his face. He didn't play, and he went on home to keep himself under the blood of the Lamb. But in a couple days, he heard where something detrimental happened to that gentleman. God will always give you an exit. But if you stand on him and obey his word and allow him to take care of it, he can do it the correct way. This gentleman was a was an elder in the church. He didn't have to get out of the Holy Ghost. He didn't have to start fighting. Nobody had to be sent to jail. Nobody got embarrassed. His, his behavior stayed that of a child of God. And God took care of it for him. It may be hard, but God will repay. The Lord can do it better than we can. In Matthew 8 and 20, 18 and 22, it says, At that point, Peter got up the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I need to forgive a brother or a sister? Seven? And I can just imagine him, him saying that, just like I got frustrated and say, Well, God, when are you going to do something? I can plainly see Peter say, well, well, Lord, what are you saying? How many times am I supposed to forgive this person? Seven times or what? Well, guess what? The Lord had an answer for him. And Jesus replied, seven, hardly. Seventy times seven. I added that up. Seventy times seven, that's 490 times. I'm supposed to forgive somebody 490 times in one day? Yes. But I would think that if you had to forgive somebody 490 times in one day, you would change company. Amen, somebody? Amen. Change company. Because that person, you don't, you don't need to be around. But the Bible says, 
Should that person do something to you have to forgive them. You have to. It's just like I have known people that for no reason they just were disrespectful, didn't like me, just did did things to upset me. I never said anything and it was hurtful. I would always still be nice. And do you know some of those people have come back to this day and say, you know what, I'm so sorry for treating you like that. You didn't do anything to me. But can you imagine if I would have gotten ugly with them? And I'm not going to say I have not always been nice. I have not always been nice. God had to work on me too. This is, this is a daily thing. Killing your flesh is a daily thing. And I can't say I always came up with the victory. But most of the time, praise God, I did. And for those people, we can look each other in the face. We forgave one another. And you go on with your life. Had I gotten ugly with everybody... I probably wouldn't even be able to sit here and even win an audience. You have to ask God to keep you. And it's called long suffering. We've got to suffer long sometimes. Look how long Christ suffered when they beat him. So it's nothing for us to just stand still. We as children of God need to have long suffering in our characteristics because we know that God's time is not our time. And if we're going through something, it must be for use for something down the line. Any questions on long suffering, anybody? Or does anyone have anything that they want to say? Okay, on to gentleness. So gentleness we find is sensitivity of disposition and kindness of behavior founded on strength and prompted by love. So, 2 Timothy 2 and 24, I have it on your PowerPoint. For those that are live, um, I will post the PowerPoint later if you want to download it. But it says, God's people must not be quarrelsome. They must be gentle, patient, teachers of those who are wrong. We need to have patience. Everyone is not going to be on the same level all the time. Um, when people are new coming into church, and then you know what, even those of us that have been in church a while, I compare it to uh, our nursing on the floor. For some reason, nurses have the reputation of eating their young. Unfortunately, it used to be true. <clears throat> However, we're turning that around, praise God. And it's because you can be in a job so long or in a place so long that you assume everyone is at the same level you are. And that's not so. Even in faith, you will find that your faith may be stronger than somebody else's faith. It depends on what you've gone through in your life. It depends on what you've faced. It depends on what you've had to depend on God for. So everyone isn't going to be in the same area. And we have to not be quarrelsome or not get irritated with one another ever so quickly. We need to be gentle and gentle in our teaching. You know, gentle words go a long way. You can mean well, but say something wrong and it's not taken so so nicely, be gentle. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. The Message Bible reads, Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Be gentle with one another. Be sensitive. Forgive one another quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. It says prompted by love. Isn't that what we said? Founded by strength, prompted by love. You need the strength to be gentle. It takes, it takes a strong person to be gentle when being ugly is so much easier. But then if it's prompted by love, the Bible does say love thy neighbor as you love yourself. You don't want to offend your neighbor you don't want to offend the person sitting next to you. 
uh, in the church pew. You don't want to offend the person sitting next to you as a co-worker. There are many different jobs, just like there's many different houses in the house of God. The Bible says, I've gone away to prepare a place for you, and in my Father's house are many mansions. That means everybody has a different job. So everyone's not going to be at the same level because everybody's calling isn't the same. You don't have to like everybody, but you have to love everybody. A perfect example. There may be people that I don't like. And there are people I don't like. It's just a personality clash or I don't like the way they act. I just, they don't like me and I don't like them. However, if they came into my clinic, if they were ill, if I saw them out on the street and they needed help, I would most definitely jump in and help them because I love them as a person. You don't have to like what they do. You don't have to agree with their personality or their actions, but you have to love everybody. Because God is love. We, we learned that in the first week. God is love. And that's the same fruit that we should be portraying as a child of God. Love. So, with the angerness and bitterness, it, do you know it'll grow like a weed? It's like the weeds out in my grass. They start small, but then pretty soon it'll eat up your grass. And my family knows I can't stand to, to see a yard where it looks like You've got tetters, they used to call, the old people used to call it tetters out of your head, spaces out of your head. I don't like that. I like my grass to look nice. So therefore, I go out there and I weed the grass. Well, when you have bitterness and you have anger, it will start as a small thing and pretty soon it will consume you. Unforgiveness will eat you like cancer. Something happened to me as a teenager and I recall my bishop at that point calling us all in the office. And he said, Tam, I'm going to need you to apologize. And I said, but I'm not sorry. He said, Tam, I need you to apologize. I said, but you're making me lie and I'm not sorry. And he said, do you trust me? I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, then I just need you to apologize. I apologized for the situation. I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now because once I apologized, I might have been done with the people at that point, but I had nothing in my heart against them. I said I was sorry and I left it alone. When I look back on that whole group, there are some of us that never made it out. There are some of us that that anger had consumed them and they were never the same. So with gentleness, treat everybody. Founded on strength, you have to be strong. You have to be strong to say, I'm sorry. You have to be strong to say, I forgive you, especially in certain instances. And it may take some work. It may take some prayer. But the Bible says we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. He is love. He is light. Keep praying. Ask God to take something from you, and he will. Ephesians 4 and 7 tells us, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on a high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So we're getting grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Have, have grace. Have grace about you. Not just grace in your, in your walk and in your behavior, like we'll say uh, somebody has such grace about them. But have grace in forgiveness. Have grace with those that aren't always like you. You can win somebody better with grace and with love than to be shunning them. So gentleness, we've got to be gentle with one another. Watch how we say things. Give uh, correction lovingly, if you will. If you don't know the words to say, think about it first. Because once words come out of your mouth, you can't take them back. Even if you have to pass them by somebody else and say, hey, this is a situation, you don't have to say names. How does this sound? 
How would you take this if I said it to you? We've got to practice, saints. Practice gentleness. We've got to practice all the fruits of the Spirit. We've got to practice. And it's going to take a lot of strength and a lot of prayer. Does anyone have anything they want to add on gentleness, being kind of behavior? Okay. Goodness. What is goodness? Goodness. Morally good. Virtuous, maybe. To be desired. Passing somebody's approval. That which is morally right. Maybe even righteous. Those are the characteristics that make up goodness. So in 2 Peter, it says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to your goodness, knowledge, and to your knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Be good, be kind, be knowledgeable, self-control, perseverance. I look at self-control and I realize that most of the fruits of the spirit are causing or calling for us to have self-control over something. And I know we used to say that women are so emotional and men are not emotional. But this tells me that they are, because this is to every child of God. This is not just to the females that they say are so emotional, but self-control is for everybody. And most of these things has to do with us being born again. It's going to take practice. When you become a new creature in Christ, that means the things you used to do, the places you used to go, the, the ways you used to talk, some of us, we had to set those things aside because they weren't the character of Jesus. And so therefore, it takes practice. It takes self-control. Psalms 27 and 13. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Have you ever met somebody that was just genuinely good? Everybody liked them. Everybody flocked to them. We had this uh, guy in our class named Dom Sugar. I remember him. And he was in our special ed group. Everybody loved Dom Sugar. He was so sweet and just genuinely kind. He would want to carry our books, even if he had to walk to the third floor and he was way down there at the art room. He was just genuinely kind. Um, it just came natural for them to be nice. That's what we want. We want to have that genuinely good spirit about us. We want to have genuine happiness. And when you allow the joy of the Lord to be your strength, you get that inner happiness and you're just genuinely nice. And that's just all there is to it. You, you don't have any other excuse or any other, uh, anything to add to that. You're just genuinely nice because of the joy of the Lord. You have no ought against anybody. You have a pleasant disposition because the spirit of the Lord should change you. If you find that you're upset all the time, you're up in arms all the time, we really need to reevaluate. What makes us happy? And I don't mean naturally or carnally. That inner strength. Are you happy with yourself? If not, find out why. Because you should have that general goodness about you. You don't have to be kiki and smiley and all the time. Everybody's not a smiley type of person. But you should have a genuine goodness about you. When the love of God consumes your life. You have no choice because God is love and God has no bitterness in him. 
So if you find somebody that doesn't have that genuine goodness, well, then you know either they're not where they need to be in Christ. You need to pray for them and say, Lord, whatever is blocking their happiness and blocking their joy, reveal it to them or remove it because we need to have goodness. Self-control also, um, it's not just for behaviors, it's for your talk. It's for your prayer life. I have found that I do better praying in the night. God wakes me up in the night and I can pray then because there's no phone ringing. There's no dog barking. I don't have to get anything out of the kitchen. My husband doesn't want to show me anything on YouTube. There's a peace of mind there. And I had to do self-control because I could be tired sometimes. But when God calls me to get up, I get up because there's a reason. And I go lay in my prayer closet, either physically or spiritually. I could be kneeling somewhere, but it takes self-control and not making excuses because you have to give God his time. We talk about tithing, and that will be an another uh, lesson, but you have to not only tithe in your paycheck, you've got to tithe in your time. God wants your time, not only in prayer, but sometimes he wants you to sit there and just meditate and be quiet so you can hear him. You can't hear him if we keep talking. If we're doing all the talking, we can't hear him. We need to tithe in our time. We need to read our scripture. There should be no way that we go from Sunday to Sunday and not crack open the Bible no time that week. We've had so much time now during this quarantine. It was a blessing. It was a blessing in some ways because time slowed down and it allowed us to take the time to see what's most important, to put our life in priority, in order. And I actually thank God because even though it's bedlam out there, I have a peace. I have such a peace. I've been able to read my scripture. I've been able to get up at 2, 3 in the morning and pray because I didn't have to get up for work at 5 o'clock. So even in our time now, give your time. Self-control. Practice. Practice it. We should have goodness. And goodness takes practice. Next is gentleness. No, wait a minute. Did I go backwards? Faith. I'm sorry. My thing messed up here. Here we are. Faith. I'm right on target. Hebrews tells us what faith is. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So, to have faith means to trust, means to not worry, means to be confident that whatever you need will be provided, whatever needs done will get done and be accomplished. Faith. Faith is... And a lot of times we use an example of sitting in a chair. We have faith that it's going to hold our weight. We don't walk over to the chair and shake every leg and make sure that it's going to hold us. We automatically go and sit down. When we go to God with something, we need to know that he has it. We need to know and be confident that he hears your prayer. In the word, it tells us, he that cometh to God must first believe that he is. And that tells us that in Hebrews 11 and 6. There's a lot of people that go to church out of tradition. There's a lot of people that call on Jesus uh, because it's habitual. I know people that are just talking and, and they say, Jesus, like it's nothing. They're not really calling on him. They're just saying it because it's habitual. You've got to believe that God is exactly who he says he is. Do you believe that God is who he says he is? 
Are you simply going about what you were told? There's a difference. I know God for myself now. When I was younger, I was taught who God is, who the Bible said he is, who my pastor said he is, who my parents said he is to them. But as I got older and I started living life and I got into situations, I found out who God is for myself. So that's what faith is, to know God for yourself and know he is exactly who he says he is. And when you go to God asking, you've got to expect it. You've got to sit there in expectation. That's faith. You don't ask it and then say, is he going to do it? And you keep looking and keep looking. You ask him in expectation that it's going to get done. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. You want to know why? Because when you're in a relationship, what's the first thing that you need in a relationship? Trust. Amen. If you can't trust him, you have no relationship with him. You got to trust him. So you've got to believe that he says he's exactly who he said he is and that he'll do it. So, the fruit of the Spirit in faith is that you can leave your burdens at the altar and know that God has them and he will take care of it. Know that even in this time of COVID, that we've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread, and we don't have to worry. I put a post on Facebook on Sunday. And for some reason, Sunday, I, I just woke up just in one of those, one of those terrible moods. I wasn't mad, but I was downtrodden. And I was saying it because I've reached a certain goal. I was blessed to pass my practitioner exam, but then I thought about it. I couldn't celebrate with my family because some of them aren't here. We can't go out anywhere. We can't go out to dinner. We can't do this and we can't do that. And I was sorrowful. So I understand what the seniors of high school are, are feeling. They strive. And this is a, a big accomplishment. But then you can't celebrate it because you can't go anywhere. But then my niece sent out a text message on our family chat and it came right on time and I thank God because even as a pastor we have those days and it seems like God sends somebody right on time to tell you something you need to hear and what she said she was talking about a drought in the land <clears throat> and there's a drought in the land but being that we are who we are the children of God we're exempt from that and we're not going to be affected by that and she told us, she told us to look for our water in the drought, look for our water. And I immediately was able to dry up my tears. And I said, okay, let's get it because I have sunshine. I'm not in a place where I can't even go outside, period. And I, I've, I've got a lake back there. She told me to, I've got water in the drought. And I was thanking God for that word because even when your man side, your, your, your carnal side has a problem because it's thinking in the mind instead of the spirit. You see, I charge my spirit to pray always. And I, I don't know if you guys know what we mean when we say that, but when I uh, go to bed at night, I charge my spirit to pray always because while your body's sleeping, while your mind is sleeping, somebody's got to be praying. And it could be that spirit man. So that spirit man that I put on duty 24-7, because your spirit man don't get tired. I put him on 24-7 and it prayed when I couldn't pray and God sent me a word. And I thank God for that. And you'll be in situations... You might not know what I'm talking about now, but you'll be coming back to me saying, Pastor Tammy, I know exactly what you're talking about. 
Because I remember when you said this, this, and this, and I was in this situation, and I couldn't pray for myself, and then all of a sudden, somebody brought something by, or somebody said something that was meant just for you. You see, that's faith when I say, okay, I'm giving everything to God. And I mean that. But then when doubt creeps in, my spirit man gets busy and says, uh-uh. I'm going to find a word here. There's, there's still a word here. Because God will still do what he says he's going to do. It might not be when you think so. But he'll always, always come through on time. He's got a good knack for coming in at the 11.59 hour. Just when you think you're about to go under. Just when you think. You're about to drown in your situation. He sends a rope or a ladder. Faith to know that God will answer prayer. Faith to know that he'll never leave you. He's, if he brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. He's going to give you strength to go through it. You just have to have faith. The Bible says have faith of a mustard seed. Do you know how small a mustard seed is? It's almost microscopic. You almost need a magnifying glass to see it. Faith of a mustard seed. He doesn't even want you to have faith of the whole world. Just a mustard seed. And if you don't have faith and you have a problem believing, will you call us? There'll be somebody to join you and help your unbelief. Somebody should say, Lord, help my unbelief. Because you see, without faith, it's impossible. You need that trust. Faith is trust. You need to trust him. Because if you don't trust him, he can't work on your behalf. Because you'll always be trying to put your hand in it. And every time we put our hand in it, it's sure to be messed up. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Have faith. The Bible says, call those things that are not as though they are. That means speak them into the existence. You're in a voice activated kingdom. The power of death and life is in the tongue. So quit saying I'm broke. Quit saying I don't have. Say it's here and I'm going to get it. It's here and I'm going to find it. It's here and I'm going to set myself up to receive it. That's how you have faith. You got to speak faith into yourself. Even if you can't physically see it, keep speaking it. Stir up the atmosphere and keep speaking it. Those people that are into Scientology call it negative and positive energy. You keep speaking it. And whatever you speak, that's what your atmosphere is going to be. And you got to believe it to be so. Praise God. Meekness. Meekness. The fact or condition of being meek. Submissiveness. Submissive, ready to conform to the authority or the will of others. Obedient or passive. Colossians 3 and 18, it tells us, Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. Some women don't want to hear that, but you have to submit yourself to the husband. The husband's, guess what? It says as it's fit in the Lord. So you better stay in God, because if you don't stay in God, she ain't got to follow you. Amen? Amen, somebody. And it says, husbands must love their wives as God loved the church. And as long as he loves you as God loved the church, and he's seeking wisdom from the Lord, you're to submit yourselves. But in meekness, they're talking about us submitting ourselves to Christ. And this goes for man and woman because, see, Christ is coming back for his bride. So I just said that the wives have to submit themselves to their husbands. So that means as brides of Christ, we have to submit ourselves to Christ. James 4 and 7 and verse 10. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will shall lift you up. Submit yourselves to the Lord. He's coming back for his bridegroom. Submit your way to the Lord. 
submit your will to the Lord. That's not always easy. We're always headstrong. We want things done right now, but submit your way and your will to the Lord and watch and see if he doesn't come through for you and on time. Now, meekness, to humble yourself, submissive, some people take that uh, the wrong way. And I can tell you meekness is not weakness. I've put that in an asterisk. Make note, saints. Meekness is not weakness. According to Professor Glenn Pettigrove of Auckland University, meekness is the ability to overcome rage and assess a situation coolly. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is we're being submissive to the Holy Ghost and we're being submissive to the way of Christ. But don't think for a moment because somebody's not reacting to you that it's weakness. It's not it, old people of God. It's meekness. And you take it for face value. Somebody is trying to portray the fruit of the Spirit. Don't push them to be ungodly. Please don't. Don't agitate. If somebody's agitating you and you know your temper, just walk away. The spirit of meekness, the ability to overcome rage and assess a situation coolly. Some of us have a problem with that. Some of us have a problem with that. Assess a situation coolly. Meekness, learn to be submissive. In that split moment when the Holy Ghost tells you, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Because the moment you open that mouth, something's going to jump out of there that you can't take back and boom, you're all messed up. Meekness. Submissive. Submissive to what God tells you. We're each individuals walking this way of Christ. What God may have for me he might not have for you. So maybe it's okay for you to wear a green bow in your head. And the Lord told me don't wear a green bow in my head. That means I have to submit myself to what the Lord tells me. That's not for me to put it off on you. If the Lord tells you something, it's for you. And you have to submit your way to the Lord. We discussed earlier, everybody's walk isn't the same. Everybody's anointing isn't the same. Everybody's calling isn't the same. But whatever your calling is, whatever your anointing is, whatever your ministry is, you got to submit to that. Anointing comes with a price. Are you willing to pay the price? That's the thing. Are you willing to submit yourself? Oh, God, I want this. And God, I want to be used over here. And God, I want to do this. I did not want, no, I didn't ask to be a pastor. Or to be here in front of everybody because then you're a spectacle. And you got to act right. You might as well keep it real, people. You don't want to act right all the time, but you have to act right. Because you cannot be in this position and live any old kind of way and do what you want to do. All of those people asking, oh God, I want to do this. God, I want to do that. Be careful because then you have to submit yourself to the will and the way of God to do what you're asking. And are you willing to pay the price. Meekness, submissive. I ask every day, God, let, let your will be my will, but not my will be his will. I want God's will to be my will. Because I don't want to clash with God's will. I don't want to do anything that gets me out of the will of God. I don't want to do anything that's going to mess me up. I don't want to do anything that's going to hinder the work of God. Is somebody with me? Raise your hand, somebody. Is anybody with me? You don't want to do anything to keep you out of the will of God. We got to submit ourselves to the way. Your pastor calls a fast. It's, it's called a sacrifice for a reason. Because you don't like it. But you have to be submissive to the will of God because he's got something for you. Praise God. Amen. The last fruit of the spirit that we will go over tonight is temperance. I'm not going to win any brownie points on this one. I can tell you now, but nevertheless, that's what it is.
Temperance. I looked it up. I researched it. Oxford Dictionary says temperance, abstinence from alcoholic drink. Woo! Look at that. I never knew it, honestly. I thought temperance meant something else. Abstinence from alcoholic drink. The temperance movement. There was a whole movement for temperance. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, the Bible says don't call anybody a fool, and I didn't, but it says here, whosoever is deceived is therefore not wise. Jesus turned water into wine, somebody says he did, but it wasn't our kind. He smashed it and they drank it. The things you have has other things in it that your body doesn't need. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 says, what? That's what it says. Look in your Bible. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? What? You don't say. So that means... If God wouldn't drink it, if God wouldn't smoke it, if God wouldn't say it, you don't need to either. Because your body don't belong to you. Your, your body belongs to the living God. And once you put his spirit in there, once he puts his spirit in there and you receive the Holy Ghost, you cannot subject him to that mess. It says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. You, you don't need it. Temperance is also emotional restraint. Here again, self-control. God's teaching us self-control. Whosoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but one who has a hasty temper exalts. Ooh, it's hot in here now. Might be tight, but it's still right. Hasty temper. Abstain from alcoholic drink. These are all things we don't want to hear. Why? Because they're fun. Big fun. And I can say that because I used to do it. Tangere straight up. But let me tell you something. I'm no longer ignorant. I'm no longer a fool. I've been delivered. Not delivered. Delivered. And I don't want anything in my body, number one, that's going to keep me from God. I don't want anything separating me from the love of God. Second of all, I don't want anything that's going to be killing me because should the rapture tarry, I plan on living a long time. I don't want nothing drying out my liver. I don't want nothing eating up my lungs. I don't want anything blowing up my pancreas. Because I need all of them. If I didn't need them, he wouldn't have put them in there. Self-control. All of these fruits of the Spirit. Look at these saints. All of them are self-control. And as a, a child of God, we need to look and act and talk differently than we did prior to becoming a Christian. The fruits of the Spirit all speak about self-control and, and speak about characteristics that we have to learn after being born again. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And he says, against such, against these things, there is no law because he wants you to have them. These are the characteristics that we need to be showing once the Lord has filled us full of himself. We shouldn't be walking around with a scowl all the time because the joy of the Lord is our strength and we love, we should be loving life right now like we have never loved life before. We should have a peace when everybody else 
is gone haywire. God gives you a peace. God gives you long suffering. And I've learned not to say patience. I used to say patience. And a wise sister told me, Tammy, you better watch patience. Because when you ask God for patience, he's going to give you situations that you need to be patient for. So I have learned to since change that prayer. Lord, give me grace. Right? Give me grace and give me strength. I want to be gentle with the saints of God and gentle with everybody. My uh, patients tell me all the time, you're so happy. We just love you as our nurse. And I'm thinking to myself, the grace of God is sufficient. Thank you, God. Because a lot of times I'm smiling on the outside and I'm tired, not feeling well, don't want to be bothered. But because every day I ask God to give me somebody I can help. And there's no better one to help you and take care of the people of God than a doctor or a nurse filled full of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing better. So when people say the saints are mean, well, then they're not displaying the fruits of the Spirit. And you need to take them to the book of Galatians and let's have a little review. Now, we can get crotchety and cranky sometimes. That's just nature. Gently remind me, uh-oh, where's your fruit of the Spirit? Help them. Sometimes we need a little help, saints. It gets hard. We need help. We need prayer. Cover us in prayer. The fruit of the Spirit. That agape love. Unconditional love. Get rid of anger. Don't let this, The Bible says don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't do it. It'll choke you out like a cancer. Don't do it. Be loving. Be gentle. Have faith. Know that God is exactly who he says he is and that he's got it all under control. Allow our fruit trees to blossom. They have to be nurtured. They have to be fertilized. You need to get in your Bible. Fertilize your fruit. Come to Bible class. Go to church on Sundays. And when we're able to convene, go to your choir practices. Stay around people that are in God. Fertilize your fruit. Your fruit needs to be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Let's not be like the fig tree, saints. Let's not upset God and have him have our tree wither up and die to where we won't bear fruit anymore. We don't want to do that. Amen. We thank God tonight for the fruits of the Spirit. And I'm going to try and get you back on where I'm supposed to have you here. I'm not good with this Zoom yet. But we praise the Lord for Bible study. We praise God for everybody that has joined with us on today. Does anyone have any questions? Does anybody have anything to add? God might have put something on your heart while I was teaching. I never want to be a mic hog or anything like that. Um, Minister Hayes says, God, faith is God's word believed. Amen. Does anyone have anything to say? Any questions or anything? Okay. If not, then we thank you for joining us here at Restoration Love Center Jacksonville for our Bible classes. Um, as I said, if you came in late, Governor DeSantis is opening the state slowly. I don't know that we will be in our sanctuary on Sunday. There are still stipulations uh, to opening the state, and we want to be mindful of that so we can be safe and be alive um, to work for God another day. Praise God. Sunday, we will have Sunday Night Live at 5 p.m. Saturday, 
Saturdays, we've been blessed every Saturday at 9 a.m. to have a wonderful prayer. You don't want to miss it. That prayer, I'm telling you, that prayer takes us through. It really helps when you can gather with the daughters and